Hi, I'm Dan, and I'm going to present a method to infer joint torques and mechanics from video. So confidence for pose estimation are getting increasingly better in taking in images and predicting the XY pixel coordinates of body parts. Uh, these algorithms are transforming fields like neuroscience because they provide a detailed yet non-invasive measure of behavior. In this example, we track the forelimb of the mouse from two views uh, in order to get 3D reconstruction. And we're using deep lab cut algorithm uh, for that. And we can see it does a very good job. Uh, but we started out this project by asking ourselves, if movement itself is the thing we care about, and if we would like to explain how the brain controls it, then maybe joint coordinates aren't enough. Maybe we need to address the mechanics of the 3D body that our cameras view, right? So we uh, would like to extract from video, and this is what we actually do, is we extract the joint angles, velocities, and acceleration, the joint torques, and we log the inertia, the gravity load, and the fictitious forces, and we learn the body parameters of the animal's body. Why are we doing that? Because we would like, for example, to answer the question, what is it that the brain controls? Uh, is it the torques or is it the end effector position? So we can uh, regress these quantities uh, with neural recordings. Uh, we can compare uh, the behavior we measure in, experiment, in an experiment with the behavior generated artificially by an agent that we can train to do this uh, similar task. And we can constrain the estimates of tracking algorithms like deep lab cut and making them uh, mechanically plausible. And as a bonus point, uh, now we can put a camera in front of a robotic manipulator, infer the hidden torques, and compare them to the control signal as the visual servo mechanism. So I'll illustrate our approach on a 3D robotic arm example, even though it is arbitrary for any rigid body. So we start from one or more views of our subject. We take those images, we push them through a convolutional tracking network, and to get uh, and with 3D reconstruction module to get 3D joint positions, those red stars. Now we will mo model those red stars as the joints of a linked robotic manipulator. We're doing that by sampling torques from a stochastic process, feeding them through rigid body dynamics equations, getting this, the angular state at any given time, and we transform the angles into 3D coordinates using the forward kinematics map. Going back from stars to torques, uh, that's a Bayesian inference problem. So our approach uh, has an articulated body governed by mechanics and subject to torques, which we're estimating and parameters that we're learning. And we drew inspiration from other cool work, namely uh, one line of work tracks uh, non-articulated bodies and models their motion using Newtonian mechanics and approximate Bayesian inference. Another line of work fits articulated body models either on a frame by frame basis or using a simple uh, constant velocity dynamics models with no notion of torques and mechanics or an imitation learning line of work that uses uh, uh, articulated bodies with mechanics and torques that move them, but usually the body model is assumed to be fixed. So now I'll replace this toy diagram with the actual hidden Markov model that we're fitting. So uh, the empty circles are the hidden states, torques and angles, and the observations, the black uh, circles are the 3D joint coordinates that we get from tracking. So to understand better what our model does, I'll uh, analyze an example of uh, Natalie, my wife, moving her arm on the XY plane and show how, can we, how we can describe it as a rigid body model. So we define the center of the world to be at Natalie's shoulder and we connect two sticks to describe her arm. If we know the stick lengths L1 and L2, this constant parameters, and if we know the, mom, the momentary angles, theta one and theta two, we can describe where the arm is at any given time. So we move to, to work with the angles the generalized coordinates and describe their dynamics in time. And uh, this dynamics is described by a second order equation over the angles as a function of the external torques. And it includes an inertia tensor, gravity load and fictitious forces. This equation holds for arbitrary rigid bodies, but different rigid bodies differ in the entries and dimensions of, of these expressions. We have a mapping from angles to joint coordinates, which is called the forward kinematics map, which I denote as mu sub y, takes in angles and spits out those red uh, sinusoidal functions of them. It's nonlinear. So uh, the first row in our model, the first set of arrows, describes the stochastic process over the torques, tau dot equals f of tau. f of tau is a user choice. In the results I'm showing here, I've used an orange chain Ullenbach process, but it could also be a Gaussian process, state space model, or a stochastic RNN. 
The second set of arrows uh, evolves the system one step forward in time, as usually done in physics engines. So we take torques and previous angles and evolve one step in time using the nonlinear uh, angular uh, dynamics function. So together we have uh, a transition distribution over the current state given only the previous state, it's Markovian. And the last set of arrows uh, applies the forward kinematics to the angles with an additional observation noise. So we get an emission distribution that is also nonlinear since the forward kinematics map is nonlinear. So we have uh, transition and emission with nonlinearities inside, and we'd like to infer the posterior over all states given all observations, but this object is analytically intractable, so we have to resort to approximate methods. We'd also like to learn the parameters of the body model, which maximize the likelihood of the data. We do this using uh, variational sequential Monte Carlo or SMC, VSMC. So SMC is a method for nonlinear state estimation. It approximates the posterior with a set of uh, weighted particles. The way it's working, uh, you have a set of particles, you propagate them forward in time according to some dynamics, you compute importance weights, how good do they explain data under your model, and you resample those particles that are better than others and you iterate until the end of the time series. Variational SMC combines this SMC with variational inference to do large scale parameter learning. And uh, this is done by taking the estimate of the marginal likelihood that SMC naturally gives us, taking the expected log of that as a differentiable uh, lower bound on the log marginal likelihood in which we can use for variational inference. And this trick was shown in those three papers below. We added another feature, which is at inference time, we run more than one SMC sampler, we run multiple SMC samplers, and we take the outer level uh, important sampled expectation of them according to how good each of them explains the data. This was crucial to, act, to accurately infer the torques. So for the results, I'll first present uh, the results with the planar arm. And while this is a simple robotic manipulator, it is uh, very influential in neuroscience and neuro rehabilitation and many uh, models were, were using it. So um, we simulate uh, this uh, planar robotic arm with this double pendulum by giving them an orange and Ohlenbach uh, torque process. And we generate noisy observations, these red stars. And those two, uh, black lines are the predictions of the inference algorithm. And we can see that we infer uh, the motion quite well and we smooth out the noise of, the, of, the, of this double pendulum, moving just by observing the noisy joint coordinates. Now the question is, these are the ground truth states that we use to move the arm. Two torques, two angles, two velocities. Can we infer them just by using the noisy joint coordinates? The answer is yes, we can infer the angles, we can infer the velocities, and we can infer the, the torques, the taus, though with, with a larger uncertainty over the actual values. And the uncertainty is over uh, multiple SMC samplers. Now we collected some homemade data, and he, this is Natalie again with an aggressively resized image, and we tracked her joints using deep lab cut, and we modeled them using a planar arm a model. And what we're showing you on the right is that we can infer uh, the torques, the angles, and the velocities in this video, even though the, the tracking performance is uh, uh, quite initial, uh, we can still uh, extract ma many meaningful mechanical quantities. And more than these quantities, we also log uh, the gravity, the inertia, the fictitious forces in any moment in time. We then move to analyze the 3D robotic arm which we define here, it's two links, and each link has two angles of rotation, yaw and pitch. So we track the, the shoulder, elbow, and end effector from two views, and then we perform 3D reconstruction of the arm, and we fit this uh, 3D robotic arm model to those uh, noisy observations. And here we're assuming a constant velocity model, and we again, we use the SMC inference method. And we can see that um, we can recover uh, the motion quite well, we can overcome jumps at, that are due to imperfect tracking or uh, to imperfect 3D reconstruction. And we can uh, get ourselves a nice uh, angular trajectory and good uh, uh, stick length parameters. And for the full uh, 3D robotic arm model with four torques, four angles and four velocities, two per joint, uh, we simulate data from this model 
We then simulate noisy observations from the, the trajectory of the angles, and we plot them as those uh, black uh, dots on the rightmost plot. And here again, uh, we can infer the, the trajectory of the robotic arm quite well using the variational SMC, and we can smooth out the noise while we do it. And as for the ground truth states that we use to, to move this 3D arm, we can again infer the angles and velocities quite well. We can infer the torques quite well too, uh, though to a slightly lesser uh, accurate extent, potentially due to the poor scaling of SMC uh, with latent dimension. And we're working on that as well. So to summarize, we transform the pose estimation problem to a mechanical state estimation problem. And we use variational sequential Monte Carlo. So we learn parameters of the articulated bodies and we infer their mechanical states and torques using Bayesian inference. And we, we think that this has lots of applications to neuroscience, for example, to ask what are, what are the, the quantities that the motor cortex cares about or what is the difference between uh, stroke patients and control patients. And we would like to refine our real data sets in mouse and humans and to regress to neural data and to extend our transition model to include general physics engines. So thank you. Okay, so I've got all the authors here, and uh, I also have a bunch of questions. I'll just call out on the author and ask them questions, and they could respond. Uh, in addition to this, there may also be questions on Rocket Chat, which I'd encourage you to respond to right after this live Q&A. So the first question for five uh, flow is, uh, in your simulation control slide, you introduce a predictor network. And how do you prevent this observation predictor network from selecting trivial states as solutions? Okay, um, so um, we use this uh, predictor network um, uh, to kind of um, yeah allow the, the the network to look further into the future, and we pre-train this with actual simulation data. So we simulate reference um, data and. On that data, we can train this the prediction network already, and then reuse this in the optimal control. And so you can just um, do a normal supervised loss for um, for matching physical states there. That's good. So uh, we have a question for Paula on Deluca. Uh, to what extent are these simulations differentiable? For example, do we get gradients with respect to all plausible contacts and stuff? Um, so for now, we do have more simplistic forms of environment. So most of our state progression, or like, or the state progression can be modeled to a differentiable function. So you can take uh, most straightforwardly derivatives through that. Um, so okay. yeah, you will get the Jacobian and so you'll have a derivative with respect to um, the state and the action at any time step. And, and then you also have Hessians. Um, and generally, everything is written in JAX and made to be a JAX object. So actually, you can basically call gradient on anything you can imagine within our library. It's just um, we focus on the aspect of differentiating through the system dynamics. Sounds good. So I have a question on the body dynamics paper. It should, should be for Dan, I guess. Uh, did you try and compare with open source projects like OpenPost uh, on your work? Yeah, so we, we haven't uh, yet compared us, ourselves with uh, things like uh, OpenPost or like uh, forward simulators like OpenSim. Uh, we did compare ourselves with uh, different uh, tracking algorithms that have some you know, spatial and temporal constraints. Um, but the thing we, we cared about most isn't just the quality of the reconstruction or the simulation, but actually the, the identity of the physical quantities in any moment in time. We wanted to, to get the inertia and to get the fictitious forces and get uh, this whole uh, inverse dynamics uh, quantities. So uh, I, I wasn't aware that you know another method can uh, accurately infer these from noisy uh, joint positions. Uh, but yeah, I'll be happy to learn more about that. Thanks. Uh, I think the next question is on the HDR paper. Is that Zhang He? Uh, yeah. 
So what what sampling strategy do you use for sampling pixels and can this method be improved somehow? Yeah, uh, for sampling, we use CRISPR sampling method for uh, getting the pix pixel values for, from the multi exposure stack. And I guess there can be more efficient or way to uh, get the samples, but because we gather all the values for zero to two to two fifty five two five five, so I don't think uh, other like method could uh, much improve the total HDR construction structure. Uh, performance, yeah. That's good, yeah. So we have a question on the blend shape paper. And it is, how do you actually choose facial landmarks and uh, will a poor choice of landmarks impact uh, the output? Have you assessed some of that? Uh, so first question, how we choose the landmark? Uh, we, uh, there is the fax system so we manually decide the uh, landmarks on the blend shape uh, according to the facts uh, system definition of the landmarks. Uh, and for the second question, can you please repeat? Yeah, it's, it's about uh, do a poor choice of landmarks impact your output a lot? Uh, like the do the landmarks have to be very carefully handcrafted or? Uh, I think what it means is if you chose something else, would your results vary drastically? Uh, okay, yeah. So um, because uh, originally the blend, blend shape can be considered as the dense mesh that, that can uh, accurately capture uh, every detail of the facial muscle or uh, of, of the deformation of the facial skin. Uh, but uh, in our workshop, uh, in, in our current work, we just use the landmarks to uh, to measure the deformation of the geometry. Uh, if we use other me uh, measurements or if we directly use the whole dense mesh, there will be uh, more accurate, uh, these are the more accurate measurements of the deformation. So we expect the improvement of the performance uh, of our top-down model if we use this uh, this mesh or other measurements instead of the landmarks. Yeah, sounds sounds great. Thanks. Uh, I have another question. I think on body dynamics. Uh, this is great work. Can you give us an idea of the types of problem that this might be applied in? The mouse model seems quite useful. Yeah. So. Um, this whole uh, statistical kind of mechanical project came came about through the actual neuroscience application. So our collaborators from, from the Coastal Lab at Columbia, they're recording from the motor cortex of a mouse while, while it's performing a, some sort of a reinforcement task. It's controlling the joystick and they're recording from several populations within the motor cortex. And one question that arose was what is actually the mechanical quantities that are being controlled and tracked by these motor uh, and neurons. So imagine that in addition to the to the stuff that I've shown you here, we have time series of say of neurons in different brain regions, and we would like to regress them with these mechanical quantities and say, well, this population cares about the end effect repose, sort of a high level representation of behavior. When I where do I want to go as an agent? And another population may control the porks and the low level sort of muscle commands. So it's a description of like biological motor control. That sounds very cool. And yeah, it's, it's a new dimension to this workshop altogether. So uh, in the interest of time, I'll just take one more last question. Uh, and yeah, of course, uh, I guess you'll have a lot of opportunity to chat about in the post session as well. Uh, so this one's for uh, Paula, like, about DeLuca, do you plan on extending the suite of simulations to other physical phenomena like soft robots or fluids? I guess there's just about you know, next steps. Yes, yes, yeah. So that's uh, our main plan uh, to basically extend to more sophisticated simulation environments. Uh, I think for the beginning, we'll still focus on tasks that are fully, like that 
we expect to be like that are differentiable inherently. But then the plan is to evolve, evolve, and maybe even consider hard setups. Sounds great. So yeah, uh, with this, I'd like to thank all of you for joining in and for taking time to answer questions. So this is how we're gonna run this panel. I I would like a quick on quick round of introduction by everybody, and then. Just, just say your name, um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to each one of you, have you uh, uh, give an open remark on what do you think differentiability is useful, and why not the alternative such as just simply computing the gradients. Okay, all right, um, so everybody knows who's who. Uh, C CJ, do you want to start? Just, just say who you are and, and, and you know, where you are. Uh, hi, I'm uh, CJ Taylor. I'm uh, with the Grass Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania. Great. Uh, Bethany? Hi, I'm Bethany Lush. I work at Argonne National Lab, specifically at the Leadership Computing Facility, which is our supercomputer facility. Okay. Wami, go ahead. Hi, guys. I'm Yue Ming, and I, I am a fourth year PhD student at MIT CCL. I work on graphics simulation and compilers. Thank you. Um, Andrea? Hi, my name is Andrea Tajesaki. I'm a research scientist at Google Brain, and uh, I also work uh, at U of T. Okay, great. Peter? Hi, I'm Peter Vitalia. I'm a research scientist at DeepMind. Thank you. Dan? I'm a graduate student in the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at Columbia, and I came to listen to you guys speaking. All right, and Joanna? Hi, I'm here, but I'm, I'm an organizer. I'm just helping, helping moderate. Okay, Kelsey? I'm similarly here, but I'm an organizer helping moderate. Okay, all right. So what I am going to do is once we have a very brief introduction, I am going to uh, just pass the mic to each one of the panelists and have each one of the panelists share with us their personal perspective uh, regarding differentiabilities and, you know, versus other alternative approach. Okay, S CJ, go ahead, please. Okay, um, wonderful. So I, I guess uh, what I'll do is actually echo a point that I that I heard on in, in your talk because it's it, it resonated with me as at Grasp and Barter here we work a lot on on robots actually stuff at the inter intersection of computer vision and robotics um, and the like. So uh, this concept of being being able to build differentiable models to help us model uh, actual robotic systems that we have. So for instance, you know, these, these legged systems that are, that are walking around in extremely complicated environments where we don't have um, uh, wonderful models to begin with, I think it opens up the op opportunity for, for us to uh, both learn models that are better, have better predictive properties, but also uh, allow us to get a control, which is what we really want to do is how do we have really performant systems that work in, work in a lot of these environments where our existing models are quite frankly at this point, uh, less than adequate. Thank you, CJ. That that's a, that's a very brief introduction of your perspective. Okay. <laughs> well, I <laughs> Thank figured you. There's a lot of people. <laughs> All right, uh, Bethany, do you, would you like to uh, say a few words regarding what what your perspective on differentiability and why it is useful and and you know what's your view on the pers what's your perspective on sort of compare that to alternatives? Sure. Um, so my background is. Uh, applied math and I've been working on machine learning for dynamical systems and more recently um, a little bit of fluids and I have not done any vision just to be clear but I am learning a lot from you, the rest of you today and um, I, I really like the idea of being able to integrate your physics simulation with your machine learning as an end-to-end -end pipeline um, and uh, I've definitely had personal experience with Estimating gradients directly from noisy data can uh, really amplify noise. So it's great if you can um, analytically compute gradients. Um, and something I'm thinking about today is that our supercomputers, we have computers coming that are going to be primarily GPUs. And I'm wondering if um, differential physics approaches to simulations could take advantage of the GPUs. I think so. I think it can. Uh, and that's definitely another direction that we, we can move toward as a community. Um, okay, uh, Wang Ming, would you like to go ahead and say a few words? 
Sure, yeah. Uh, so first I would like to answer Bethany's question. So can differential physics leverage GPUs? If the answer is yes, we do have a Tai Chi system that can generate code for both CPU and GPU system. And uh, you write the code in Python, the compiler will generate GPU code for you. So it's an easy way to somehow leverage GPU resources nowadays. And uh, my perspective on differential physics is that, first of all, I really like it. And uh, uh, we have C for certain problems by in, uh, utilizing the analytical gradients, the optimization will just run ridiculously fast and uh, compared to reinforcement learning, we have clearly a very, very huge advantage here regarding exploitation of existing strategy. But there's one thing uh, that I, I want to highlight, which is uh, according to our experiment, we do find that differential physics tend to get trapped in local minimum, just because uh, now we have much more accurate gradients and if the gradient, if the real gradient is zero, then it's zero, which means you're not making any progress there. So that's one thing. And the other thing I think differential physics can actually help us solve is on more the connecting virtual and reality world side because nowadays a lot of people, especially uh, robotics people, are really, really interested in how to reduce the same to real gap. And uh, apparently differential physics allows us to somehow uh, combine the real world data from the real world experiments with the simulation data. And uh, by doing this kind of optimization, we can do hybrid simulators that can close the same to real gap. That's my, my humble point. <laughs> Great perspective. Thank you. Um, Liam, are you, are you there? Yeah, great. Okay. I, we got I, you. I am here, but I, I meant to be just an organizer. I, I, I still have my own opinions about these things, but I, I would prefer to just, uh, maintain my Im impartial organizer status. If that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, actually talking about organizer, I forgot to introduce one person, but I think that person doesn't need introduction and that's Krishna. <laughs> Everybody say hi to Krishna. Okay. All right. Thank you, Leon. Okay. Um, actually, you know what? If you are here, you cannot escape. We are going to come back to both of our organizers to ask them for their opinion at the end of this. <laughs> but but we, we, will, we will reserve the space for them at the very end, uh, the honorary position. All right. Uh, Peter? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess I would say that, um, you know, optimization is, is, is it's some kind of search process and mm -hmm. uh, differentiability offers really uh, efficient ways of, uh, you, know, you know, can drive algorithms that are very efficient at searching. Um, and so like, you know, I think that's also underneath a lot of what, you know, the benefits of, you know, say different, you know, even just training neural networks uh, with uh, backprop rather than some kind of like reinforced algorithm, right? This is the root of that. Um, but another thing that I talked about in my talk that I think is a, an important thing uh, that we can sort of exploit about differentiability and auto differentiation is uh, like I was showing a few a few uh, projects where we're taking physical relation you know relations from physics that uh, sort of relate say part like the partial derivatives over spatial quantities to the time derivatives and we can sort of efficiently calculate gradients using jacks or TensorFlow or whatever and then uh, and put those inside our models so we can sort of exploit these inductive biases from physics um, very easily with a few lines of code. Um, and then we can do things like Hamiltonian mechanics um, to sort of you know, build that into our model um, and get all sorts of you know, uh, energy conservation and uh, different types of generalization that, that we're interested in. And just the last thing I want to say, um, addressing what um, uh, Yuan Ming said about the sharp gradients, I think that an interesting direction we should be um, thinking more about, and I mean, people, people, some people are thinking about this, I think it's thought about this for a while, but um, yeah, like these really accurate models with these kind of like very detailed gradients. If we're trying to optimize something, that's not actually what we want to optimize. What we want to optimize is a convex function that ha happens to have the same global minimum as that function, right? So I think that thinking about how to, um, you know, take very accurate forward models or maybe even knowledge of the gradients of those and come up with other models that are going to support more, even more efficient search is, could be, you know, very good for us in the future. Um, so that, that's that's all I would, I would say. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, that that's really a, a interesting thoughts. Um, next, I think I'm going to go to um, Andrea. Hi. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, yes. please. I guess my perspective is a bit different. It's less from the physics side and more from the robust computer vision side, uh, where I both work with uh, estimating noisy gradients from data as well as more analytical gradients from whatever forward process you have. Um, I think the most 
thoughts in regard, the most interesting thought in regard to this particular topic that I have is actually uh, with, via meta learning. So I think meta learners are something that is particularly this year uh, becoming a bit more popular, I guess, starting from the vision side in, in being able to estimate gradients by examples. And, and in that sense, basically you have, uh, you have stochastic estimates of, uh, of, of gradients, but then uh, at test time, they actually behave in a very smooth way. So it, it reconnects a little bit to what your uh, to what Leo was saying a couple of seconds ago. Um, so that's what I think is is a, an extremely interesting part. Is like there is there is this divide where you could do it by full differentiability or just gradients, but it's actually not true. There is a continuum in between the two different domains, at least in my side of the problems. But interesting perspective as well. Um, great. Um, so, Georgia, would you like to say a few words? Um, actually, we didn't we missed your introduction, so please, uh, you know, state your name and, and your your current affiliations, and then you know your perspective. Sure. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me, and hi to everybody else. Um, so, my name is Georgia. I'm a research scientist at uh, Facebook AI Research. Uh, I have been and I am still a computer vision researcher, so I care a lot about uh, computer vision problems, in particular um, object recognition. Uh, and I am an empiricist at heart, so uh, for me, whatever works is great. Um, and so in terms of that and trying to make object detectors and recognition work better and better every day, uh, we have been exploring whether um, differentiability in uh, 3D could help us with understanding 2D um, and not just for 3D tasks. Uh, and this is, I think, uh, my interest and why I, have, I am here and the perspective that I have. Uh, it's, uh, the verdict is not out yet. We don't really know uh, how to make our detectors and recognition systems work uh, better. Is it data, um, annotated data? Is it uh, better? representations by going to 3D uh, we is a better optimization. We don't know, but we are exploring. Uh, and this is what I'm interested in. OK, great. All right, so if the organizers are here, they are not escaping. I'm putting them on the spot. Sorry, Krishna, your thoughts. <laughs> so uh, yeah, like in terms of differentiability or uh, like my thoughts usually were if we've spent years of research just developing, you know, techniques like rendering or multiple geometry or physics simulation, why just throw them all down the drain and like do, I don't know, model free learning? So yeah, my forays actually started from that perspective. Like, can we somehow try and use all the knowledge that we already have and instead improve systems rather than like replace them? That, that's where I see differentiability is a very strong scheme. But I don't see differentiability as the end in general. Like I, I think there needs to be a blend of things that you can specify differentiably. And there's always things that you cannot specify differentiably. You need to learn them. So th there's like a hybrid that we need to shoot for. I agree. All right, Liam, what do you think? Uh, so I, I'm a robotics guy. Uh, I'm a prof at the University of Montreal and I'm actually Krishna's advisor. And so, I mean, the the hope here is that, I mean, what we've always wanted for representations for robotics is that uh, they're, they're task informed. And I think that um, the real hope here is that the tools of this community uh, can provide us roboticists with methods and methodologies by which we can take performance on an end task on some metric and feed it all the way back to learn perceptual representations. And that's a lot of what the research that, um, that Krishna is doing is about. And I think that this is a super powerful thing. And then I also really like, um, I think it was CJ who was talking about, or, or sorry, maybe Yan Ming, uh, talking about this, uh, you know, the sim to real element of this and how uh, now if we can get these back propable uh, tools like physics that we can actually optimize simulators for uh, directly, uh, to close this into real gap, this is another like extremely powerful thing that could have real applications for um, for robotics. So I would almost consider myself more as like an end user of most of the technologies that are being created by the panelists. In some sense. Great. Okay. All right. So I am wondering if the panelists uh, 
can comment on what do you think, what are the name your dream application that you think can sort of unify, I, I think I already started mentioning some of that in, in my comment uh, when Krishna asked me, what, what are the possible application? So let's kind of start dreaming together. Um, what are some of the possible applications that can unify vision, graphics, physics, community together that, you know, different community with different background can achieve together and, and machine learning, of course, right? That cannot possibly do alone by itself. So what, what are some of the dream possibility and application that you can think of? Uh, you know, based on sort of the conversation that we have so far that you think will be really exciting and, and challenging and that actually require vision, graphics, physics, community to work together. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, machine learning. I keep, keep dropping it out because uh, it's this is, this kind of taken for granted. We, you know, everybody is using machine learning now. Uh, so how, how can we, you know, these multiple community work together to advance one or two or three or whatever X number of application that is not possible earlier. So I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to just kind of go around in a wrong Robin fashion. I'm going to put uh, CJ as the, our first, I'm going to put him on the line and, and ask him to, <laughs> to, to share with us his thoughts. Okay. CJ, uh, go uh, ahead. I think this is actually something that, that, that Georgia picked up on, but uh, this vision, this, uh, no pun intended, uh, the idea of the vision being sort of the uh, inverse problem of, of graphics is, uh, is something that I think, you know, is, uh, has been around as an idea in the community for quite a while, but I think the kind of techniques that have been discussed here, where, as you said, there's a, there is a graphics acting as this forward engine, uh, but then allowing us to interpret, uh, interpret images in terms of being able to, to, to uh, um, uh, use these tools to actually pull back out meaningful or salient representations, I think is a, um, could be a fun thing that, that could be a fun thing to take a, take another crack at. Okay. Um, should I go around one by one or is there anyone who want to jump in? Can I jump in? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thanks for letting me, letting me jump in. So uh, actually I have, a, have two fans on this. I still believe that uh, uh, Robotics application will be a really, really great application uh, of what we have developed here, including differential vision, graphics, and uh, differential physics. Because uh, I, I think nowadays um, a lot of robotic applications are still um, based on traditional control methods, and uh, uh, apparently, uh, as we have shown in our recent work in differential physics, we can already just use brute force gradient descent to, on one hand, first. Uh, make robotics training much faster because uh, now uh, using gradient descent, it converges one or two orders max, uh, magnitude faster than reinforcement learning. And secondly, I do believe that uh, somehow closing the same to row gap can be one very meaningful application of uh, differential physics because there are just so many ways to inject arrows in physical simulators. It could be uh, one model that doesn't really reflect the reality. It could be one wrong physical parameter that is system, system identification. It could be uh, something numerical arrows where a new deep neural network can actually correct. So uh, I think those two uh, topics like accelerating learning and uh, closing sync to row gap are what uh, differential programming is really good at. And uh, I think both of them have great applications in robotics. That's my two cents. <laughs> great. All right. Uh, anyone else want to jump in next? Yeah, I'll, I'll say something. OK, go ahead. Go ahead, so Peter. I think that I think the most important problem in AI is uh, is cons like construction or tool synthesis. So I think partially is because I'm I might be biased, but I think this is also one of the most important parts of human intelligence. I think it's sort of what in some sense di distinguishes us from uh, you know other forms of intelligence. And uh, and I think that when when we try to attack the problem, we we start to think about what does it take to you know just to you know, build some building or even just like fix something that's broken in our house. There's you're immediately faced with this enormous search space. And so the question is like, you know, physics is a small set of rules and it can give rise to a tremendous amount of, uh, like it can be realized in an in infinite, in infinity of sort of, uh, you know, different scenes and different scenarios. 
And how do, so how do we search through that? And how do we sort of find things so quickly that, you know, kind of work? And what's that process that we use? And then the reason I think that that can also be sort of tied into graphics and vision is, so there's this, there's this paper I like from um, uh, Sandy Pentland and uh, Ted Adelson from about uh, 25 years ago or so, where they, they're talking about, it's about like uh, sh uh, perception of shading, sort of vision, human vision, perception of shading. And they, they talk about this workshop metaphor. And the idea is like, how would you, it's like this very generative approach to vision. So like the inverse graphics thing uh, was mentioned a minute ago. Like, how would you build this scene out of components? Like, how would I build this scene out of, you know, I have a phone here and I have like a book over here. So in some sense, it really is also a construction process, even to form an interpretation of what's around you. Um, and I think that some of the uh, like similar challenges are, are at play here. Um, and uh, and this is an old idea, right? Of course, like even like people like Irv Rock and perception, I've talked about this for a little bit of logic of perception, but I really think that one thing that we probably could spend more time on in machine learning is thinking about representations that support sort of a lazy, almost sparse generation of structure and of hypotheses or solutions, um, because that's really the, the, how the world is organized and that the problem that one of the most important problems that humans face and that I think we need for AI. Um, I think vision, graphics, and physics have a lot to, like, you know, learning and, and exploiting knowledge of these things has a lot to say about that. I agree. Uh, Andrea, Bethany, or Liam? Sure. Uh -huh. um, I guess that from my point of view, like in putting the, the three fields together, right, um, often I ask myself the question, I look at my daughter and ask myself, she has, uh, when she was one especially, she can navigate in three space without any problem. She can grab objects, manipulate them, perform significantly better than any robot that you've ever seen. And, and when, I, when I'm looking at her, I'm thinking, what kind of media was she exposed to? Uh, was she exposed to 14 million images, ImageNet, right, with labels, uh, maybe less, right? But then you might ask yourself the question is like, what if you have a, a child that doesn't have verbal communication, like an autistic child, right? Will they be enabled then to, to operate in this space? Um, I'm not an expert in this area, but my, my gut feeling is that that would be uncorrelated uh, from, from the ability to perceive and operate in this space. And therefore the question becomes, what are we allowed to provide neural networks as inductive bias to actually learn what the world looks like? And, uh, and the more and more I think about it, the more and more I'm convinced that the only inductive bias that you're allowed to use is physics. Um, and, and this comes in the form of either simulation, because you know these are the laws of the universe, right? You know that they are valid. You know that whatever you're doing, as far as you're introducing them, they cannot be violated because they're, they're just there. Uh, and, and if you look at some of the progress that, that has happened over the last year, uh, some of the biggest advances in, in differential rendering, what have they done? They have just respected physics, right? They have respected, for example, modeling of transparent media that was a scene representation network and neural volumes and then uh, NERF. They did exactly that. Uh, they have done um, modeling of light scattering events with light fields in NERF. Like, and, and I find this pretty inspiring. And, and, and I think a lot of my agenda right now is driven is like, okay, this is the only, if we are to build the computer vision and, and the differential physics of the future, this is the only thing that I'm allowed to use and everything else is just cheating. And it might be okay for the time being because you might still build products and, and, and companies and applications, but it's still cheating. It's like uh, you're allowed only to, to give a network what a two-year-old or a one-year-old has access to. Okay, all right. Uh, do we, Georgia, uh, or actually Bethany, I think Bethany want to say something when, when uh, Andrew. Uh, um, I'm curious if vision um, can be helpful in climate modeling or weather or other environmental problems if we have a satellite imagery to augment incomplete physical models. Um, and something I'm curious about, but I am not knowledgeable of the available imagery data sets. I, I would imagine so. I would imagine so. It, the, of course, climate, it's now you're talking about, you know, large scale eddy simulation. So it's, it's much, much bigger. And, 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 and that's a really, that's actually an area of a tremendous potential because 
we're looking at climate change and at a global scale um, bigger than ever before. Uh, that's a great, that's a really a great application. Yeah, and I will say that there, um, there has, I, I'm aware of uh, early work that's been done, for instance, in looking at satellite imagery to try to estimate fluid flows and the like, but I, mm -hmm. I can certainly see an application for uh, marrying this with a, with a physical model underneath it to help us right. uh, do a better job uh, of interpreting that kind of data. I think that would be a very profitable um, line of research. Yeah, yeah. And that's really, uh, I mean, that's an area of potential impact at a very large scale. I mean, we're talking about global scale, right? The world scale. Uh, and and it particularly combined with, like I say, large scale uh, eddy simulation that kind of track how the, you know, the fluid flow of atmospheres and how that would evolve together with just century the data. And I think that it will be really kind of interesting. I just don't know anybody is working on that because there's many of the, the work in this area, it's mostly done by people who are in academia and, and industry research labs. I, I don't know how many, I mean, of course you are, uh, in, in national lab really are <clears throat> thinking about taking the latest research and really pushing it forward you know, to solve some of these really important problems at the, the national and, and the world scale and, and the earth scale. So that potentially mm -hmm. will be of tremendous impact. Yeah, the national labs are definitely talking about how to use um, machine learning methods on these um, kind of climate um, right. type problems, but I don't know about from the graphics or vision perspective, if anyone's kind yeah. of uh, crossing those fields. I, I, I'm not aware of any. I mean, this is just, I mean, this is why the panel discussion is so interesting, right? Because we all bring our different perspective. So this is really, really uh, interesting thoughts. Um, okay, that, that is, keep that thoughts. So we'll follow up. Uh, Georgia, would you like to say a few words uh, what you think are your dream application? Um, yes, of course. Uh, I mean, a lot of the things that people have said so far uh, also are, um, are part of my interest as well. Um, I'm also trying to, like, just from what Bethany just said, um, it's always, I think, our, we should actually be thinking more um, globally in terms of what it is with these applications and what it could be of impact. Of course, we all want to you know, build models that operate like the human brain that like they're very intelligent. And this is something that we might achieve, but we also might not in this lifetime. But there is definitely a lot of good gain from uh, making, building models that uh, tackle problems that are beyond the scope, um, like climate change, um, ethics, uh, all these topics that are sometimes less um, brought to the forefront. Uh, so there's something that I, I would like to see more of. I would like to see more attention and more um, examples and more research on these type of, of problems that affect all of us right now. Um, and then uh, like, I think that I would like to, um, based on what Andrea just said, uh, you know, how do we envision of training these systems if we want to reach this golden standard of I have now trained like a human brain or like another brain of that level of understanding. And um, I am not, I'm not settled yet as to what is the right approach, whether we, we should simulate that how humans learn um, or whether we can take a just different approach. You know, humans have like billions of years to establish how they learn. Uh, it doesn't mean that we need to stick to that. Uh, there might be other avenues, other paths. Not that what we're doing right now is anywhere as effective or as pretty as how humans learn. That's like very far from reality. Um, but these are all sort of the questions that go in my head and what I would like to see us uh, tackle in the future. Great. That's good. That's great. Um, Leon or Krishna? Uh, Leon, go ahead. You want to say a few words? Hi, sure. Yeah, like I really, I really like what uh, what Andrea was talking about. Like I have kids too, and looking at your one year old, and it's amazing. And I also remember seeing these videos of like crows solving in incredibly complicated 
little problems to get um, to get seeds or whatever the crow's eat. I don't know. And uh, what was amazing about those things, particularly to me, was that they all involved notions of intuitive physics. Like they needed to understand that some things flowed and they, or, or that they could use a stick and pry something up or that a rock has weight and that it would actually cause something to happen. And uh, when I saw those videos and I thought about what we can do with a robot, it, it's just uh, like the gap is, is still so large between the state of the art robot and a crow like and and so so maybe that's like a little bit uh disheartening as a robotics researcher but yeah. also i think that you know there's such a great opportunity and i think these um these notions of being able to understand physics and uh you know and and i completely agree that like this is the right inductive bias that needs to be like uh imposed on these problems but that we can somehow, uh, you know, through through these notions of compositionality and understanding of intuitive phys physics, that we can get to the point where uh, where robots could solve kind of m something on that scale of of, uh, of task complexity. So that's for me. That's the that's the goal. Great. And Krishna, do you want to say a few words? What do you think? What are your dream yeah, applications? I, I mean, there's plenty, but to be really brief, I think I'd really love to see all of these communities working together. It seems like a lot of these goals are shared, but the kind of work that happens is very, very disjoint. And that, that was the motivation behind this whole workshop to try and see if there are synergies, like can the differentiable physics and rendering communities interact? We've already started seeing that uh, a bit, and we've also seen synergies between the computer vision and differentiable rendering community. So yeah, I'd like to see all of us working together. Okay, we'll be starting to write joint paper after this, right? <laughs> okay, sounds great. Okay, um, anyone else? Want to, did I miss anybody who wanted to say a few words about what are their dream application? Or even audience? You can always chat. Um, okay, um, if not, we're gonna move on to, uh, to the, the next question, um, which is, do you think differentiable pipeline or programming will make model-free methods absolutely? What do you all think? Anyone want to volunteer to jump in? Yep, I can jump in. Okay. <laughs> uh, so um, I think the current situation is, uh, so th I, th I think there are two, two things. The first thing is that uh, building differentiable programming models for everything is not yet possible at this point. And there are still a lot of, uh, a lot of physical phenomena or whatever process that we are able to simulate forward, but back propagating can be very, very tricky. So uh, that's my point one. And my point two um, is that uh, uh, actually, um, okay, I think I forgot my point two. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in again when I come up with my, uh, when I come up with my point two, okay. Okay, we'll come back to you. All right, CJ. I guess I have something that uh, hopefully at least tangentially related. Um, and uh, I, I want this is in reaction a bit to a point that, that Yuan Ming made, made that, I, that, I, that I really agree with that, that uh, um, conquering the sim to real graph is, a, is of course a, a primary challenge. But the other thing I would point out is, is that um, the robot that you train for is always different from the robot that you go to the field with. Is you're going to go to this field with a robot, there's going to be a short in the motor, the, the prop is going to be bent, and the model that you, work, that you worked with that you trained so hard with is actually not good on the day. And so I, I just have pointed this issue that there's a time scale issue that we need to be able to do this adaptability quickly in the field like the crows do when they're having a bad day, but they're able to actually actually snap back into it uh, in, in very short order. And perhaps the inductive bias induced by these physics will allow us to, to lower that manifold dimension in a way that makes this possible. But practically speaking, for somebody who takes robots to the field, this is, this is where things bust, break. So it means we need robustness training. <laughs> okay, that, that's great. This is great. Um, 
Anyone else? Anybody want to say? I mean, yeah. Go ahead, Peter. Um, so, uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's. I, I sort of hope so in a way, but I don't think so. Um, the, so I, I guess the, the issue is that um, you know, if you have like discrete sort of problem spaces and. Uh, you, you're sort of thinking about like discrete actions, search trees, and things like this. This is harder for you know. This is not clear how you're going to sort of exploit differentiable, uh, you know, like functions or pipelines to handle these things. At the same time, I mean, you you know, there's people. There's like a lot of work on um, you know continuous relaxations of sort of discrete things. So I think again, like another. This is sort of in the spirit of the thing I was saying before about. But like you don't really care about the, the sharp function what you actually care about is the thing that you can optimize well again maybe like we can start to think about ways of taking discrete problems state spaces action spaces and, and you know relaxing them or coming up with differentiable functions so we can exploit their efficiency for search and uh solving our problems that way so i mean yeah in general i don't think that in the near term we're, we're going to think model free methods do have a lot of advantages um but but in the long term i think that it's you know it's an interesting thing to even try to challenge I, I, I would agree, uh, but I would love to hear anyone else who have different opinion or even similar thoughts, but they, they may want to add comments on top of what Peter has said. Andrea, I, I mean, think I, you I, want I, to say something. Yes, go ahead. I don't necessarily want to, to put something on top of what Peter, what Peter said, but um, if you look at the at the way in which people have been looking at uh, differentiable vision and graphics from the image generation point of view, right? What has it been now? Five years uh, ballpark between the first application of deep learning to to a parameterized version of something that you can render, um, and as of this year, we are model free, right? So we we still have a model, but this model can be learned in a way that is completely oblivious to what you're actually representing it has full representation power and it doesn't matter what you're looking at it's still going to be able to do it up to a certain precision right so i think that if i were to ask something from the people working on differentiable physics would be if it was me working i do have a bit of background in physics but very little but if it was me i would ask myself is like okay can i take everything that i know from physics like stress tensors and can i take uh, the formation gradients and can i can I take Newtonian dynamic and can I now apply it to, to a representation that can be learned completely from scratch without relying on any instantiation of topology of dynamics or anything. It's just like you give it examples and then it just picks it up. And as far as you've exposed it to enough examples, it will be picked up. So essentially the same thing that happened to, to graphics and vision over the last two years. Yes. Two year and a half, um, according to when you count, but, uh, and I've never seen anything like that. Like I, we know, we know that these uh, these perceptron actually represent surfaces, but do we have a, a model for the formation of a of a surface that, that is actually not represented by a, a mesh or a voxel grid? Or something? No, we don't. I think that's a super interesting direction where I would be um, thrilled to see some some progress. Interesting thoughts. Very, very. Uh, it's very. Uh... I, I, I would agree as well. Uh, Leon or Krishna or Georgia, Bethany, anyone want to follow up? Oh, I mean, did you figure out what your number two was? <laughs> uh, so I, I, I didn't, I totally forget my point two, but uh, probably I can talk a little bit of my point three. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so my point one was about. Uh, uh, for, for, for certain simulation, it's either non-differentiable or we don't know how to differentiate it. And uh, I think uh, because I also work on the compiler's perspective, so uh, I also care about performance. So uh, it's often the case that uh, for certain simulators that we know how to do very efficiently uh, regarding forward simulation, but for backward simulation, there are some always uh, a lot of like uh, issues on computational efficient efficiency. I think uh, as Professor Lin just showed that uh, certain simulators leaders are just not uh, as efficient as uh, uh, people might think. And uh, also the memory consumption can be uh, one issue. And uh, so that's why I do believe that developing uh, high performance compilers that are more suitable for modern computer architecture and uh, suitable for uh, certain problems is super, super important because um, 
only if we scale up the simulation resolution to a very, very large scale, can we approximately, uh, can we reasonably good approximate the world. And I actually do have a point four. So um, the point four is why I do think uh, probably sometime in the future, people will like uh, differential physics. So that is basically because I, I do think uh, human brains um, has something like a built-in differential physics inside. Uh, just because uh, recently, you know, there's a COVID and uh, uh, when I'm outside, I cannot touch anything. So I can magically, always magically come up with ways to operate uh, stuff without touching anything. One example is that now I learned how to gently operate the elevator using my knees without using my hands. And also uh, if I want to uh, open open the door, I learn how to uh, use my elbows instead of using my hands. So um, if you look at reinforcement learning, it's, it will take a lot of trial and error to, uh, for an agent to learn how to do that. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, if we assume that there is something like a differential solver in, in, my, in, my, in my brain, uh, I can just uh, maybe do some mental uh, and model-based attempts, and then I can get some feedback, and the gradient from differential physics will tell me how to adjust to achieve my goal. So I do believe human uh, learn quite, should, should learn actually quite fast, a lot more faster than what reinforcement learning are currently doing. And uh, I learned that lesson from Josh Tenenbaum and he always says that uh, he doesn't believe like, uh, uh, he, he, he does believe that human has very strong power and uh, human learn things very, very efficiently. And there should be a reason. And maybe to some extent that reason is differential physics and we would definitely want to adopt more systems that are differentiable in our learning pipeline so that we can learn much more efficiently. Very, very interesting thoughts. All right, do we have anybody who agree or disagree? Anybody want to follow up on that? That's a very, very interesting thought. Does our brain think like a differentiable physics <laughs> or differentiable vision? <laughs> oh, we have a differential, oh, we have a differentiable mind. I guess I could jump in. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Not to go. answer that question. I don't have that answer. Um, but mostly to sort of, it's I, actually, it's a question rather than a statement is how will we know? So how will we know if this is the case? So, and so what I'm trying to get to is, let's say that we focus on this one task and we manage to train a system that maybe does this and figures out just how Yaming said, how to just adapt or how to do the same thing in a variety of ways. Um, but we ultimately don't really have a test bed to evaluate whether we've actually learned to think or to perceive or to understand like um, humans. So I guess the question is, how will we ever know whether we're making progress when we are definitely operate as researchers, we operate in a very task driven way. We define little tasks, little goals that we want to achieve. Um, so how will we ever be able to know if we actually have unlocked something? I do have something to say on that, if I am not talking too much. Um, oh, go ahead. Please. Yeah, so I, I do believe that we ultimately we would do something like uh, something like ImageNet for computer vision. And we do need a very, very nice physics benchmark data set so that people can, be, can have a consensus on at least compare what kind of differential, uh, what kind of learning method on differential physics, uh, like uh, at least we can evaluate different methods on differential physics. We, we need a common evaluation standard so that we can really push the field of uh, somehow combining reinforcement learning and differential physics together. So at this point, uh, I think the issue is that uh, 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 graphic uh, differential physics are um, still somehow maybe mostly in the graphics, uh, graphics and physical simulation community. And uh, this is kind of a, uh, a little bit of isolated from people who are really doing learning and robotics. And I, I, th I do think that's why we need to gather here to talk about future solutions. So uh, I think we really need to make the existing differential physics system easy to use and uh, easy to, easy, easy to uh, benchmark. So that's one very uh, important thing. I do think that uh, the birth of ImageNet as a common standard for evaluating different uh, 
deep learning system has drastically pushed forward the recent advances of deep learning. Like without a uh, common consensus of, of which method is better, we cannot make, uh, we cannot push things forward. We do need a good evaluation things, uh, thing. And uh, currently the issue is we don't have, we haven't built that uh, uh, common standard yet. And I do look forward uh, something like, uh, the image net, uh, something that corresponds to image net to appear in the field of differential physics. That's, that's definitely a really interesting thought. And, and I would argue the same probably would apply to even robotics where RL has been used extensively. Um, so we don't have exactly a set of benchmark for robotics community, even though there is sort of a standard list of 12 different robotics, you know, categorizations of grasping, planning, control, and manipulations, you know, and sensing perception and so on. So there really isn't a set of benchmark even for robotics. Although, although that due to differentiable physics, now robotics community is using more simulations and they're sort of starting to have this, you know, like the ants, uh, the, the walking dog, you know, the mobile robots. So there are some of these models are coming up. So uh, I, I do think there is a lot of potential there. Um, and, and vision, it's sort of tying currently to ImageNet, but in the real 3D world where you really need 3D vision, Im ImageNet is still inadequate, right? Because this, the 3D world is much bigger than what ImageNet has captured. But that's really a tremendous bench, you know, it comments that I think that we do need some sort of benchmark in every single community. And that's definitely worthwhile to sort of explore. Now, do we have anyone else who want to comment on whether we think that differentiable pipeline is going to make model-free methods? Absolutely. I think, I think there is some sort of consensus here. The question, it seems like the answer is no, predominantly. Am I, am I correct? Or do you have, do we have somebody who want to argue otherwise? No, it, 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 we, we are going to make, uh, the differentiable pipeline is going to make model-free methods, absolutely. I haven't heard that yet. Okay. If not, we're going to move forward and say, how how do you how do you see differentiable method being used and apply in the wild? Anyone have thoughts on this? Do, do you think we are ready? Do you think we we how robustly can they run? Do you think? So. I don't have thoughts, but I have context to just add here. Particularly in terms of, let's say, differentiable physics, there are things that you can never hope to model, maybe disturbances like the wind or so, or you know, there might be very complicated objects that you can't always encode in, you know, code. And even in rendering, you're always faced with something that's different from the real world. There's always some residual you can't hope to close in. So I guess that that's a very interesting thing to consider. Like, do we want these systems to run ready, you know, in the wild on uh, real data? Or do we look at other midterm transfer uh, solutions like, you know, you train in simulation and then try simple real transfer. I don't know, yeah, just opening up more thoughts. So just some random thought. Um, so maybe surprisingly, um, I have to say in many fields, even for physics simulators are not accurate enough. There are many reasons people can introduce errors in forest physics, including uh, like uh, discretization errors and uh, inaccurate um, model assumptions and also uh, wrong boundary conditions and inaccurate physical properties. There are uh, many, um, issues, even in forest simulation. So I, I think given that, it's fine to tolerate some uh, current learning issues of uh, differential, differential physics or differential programming tools in, uh, and adopt that in current learning system because um, there are a lot of issues in forest physics simulation, but there are a lot of, a lot of people already using forest physics for uh, computer aided engineering, for uh, reinforcement learning. So I think uh, we are, I, I wouldn't say we're 100% ready, but I think what, what is exciting in the academia is that uh, people are always eager to uh, try new things. And uh, that's why uh, we call it research. Yeah, Here, Peter? I'll say something. So um, 
Yeah. Yeah. So like, I think that um, this is something I think about a lot, like, you know, how we're going to take a lot of the stuff I showed, you know, we're taking these simulators and we're training some neural network on to, to, you know, mimic a simulator, but that's like sort of easy compared to having something that learns about the real world. Um, and I feel like I haven't really had a, sort of come to a decision about how we should approach this problem in general. So one thing I've been thinking recently though is like, so I think just to say like as background, I think a lot of times like, for a while I think like, how do we turn the world to, you know, what we perceive their eyes into objects and you know, different things that you actually find inside a, a physics engine, because that's what we need our models to do. And the more, more lately I've been thinking something different a little bit, but instead of thinking about it like as, like it's just, it's just a series of representation transformations. So we have like whatever our sensors are, collect some image, you know, grid, like a, maybe a regular grid of little pixels, whatever, volumetric data, whatever it is. And the question is really just how do we stage, like how do we, uh, you know, have a stage of transformations into representations that uh, we want. And what I mean by want is like the thing that's going to help the downstream task, like it was discussed before, or like the efficient computation or, or efficiently learnable. So I think that I, I'm really starting to think about kind of like, um, you know, resource rational or kind of like, you know, economically rational, uh, you know, way of thinking about how we can just go right from the sensory data all the way through representation and really try to bring in cost of computation, cost of learning, and the cost of whatever your, you know, task cost is. And the last thing I'll sort of say on this is, I think it's kind of interesting to think about what scientists do. So like a physicist has a model of, you know, the uh, universe or something. And, or, 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 you know, at any scale, you know, a, a model of water and particles and things like this. So like, what, like, there's not actually, you know, atoms, like this is just a representation that's very convenient for us to compute and it like solves lots of problems and we can kind of like extrapolate really, really well. So I think it's kind of interesting to just think about the different trade-offs through science and the, the models that are very prominent, effective, powerful, why those trade-offs were made. And, you know, from that sort of get ideas about how we can start to structure our kind of like, you know, again, economically rational choice of representations, computations, um, where, where, where we're going to take our observations, you know, of the world and turn those into models. So it's really sort of the same thing. Um, that's all. <laughs> I I I I think that's that's really a that's that's correct and um and and I think the parallel a parallel analogy is probably like autonomous driving right we are putting these neural network train uh, learning to drive module on the street dealing with the real world uh, and and most of these scenarios are all capturing the very clean data. Uh, using very clean model, and now it has to be tested on a while. And so, I I, I don't think you know it, it will take a lot of learning. But but I, I I do think that this is really sort of very interesting things for us to kind of think about in terms of a sort of building on top of what you learn. And, and your model doesn't have to be perfect. It it learns to improve itself through the process. Uh, do we have anyone else who want to comment on this? Sure, maybe I'll say a few words. So, I mean, I think in the, so the question was like, is this ready for the wild? And I mean, there, there are some things that are already out in the wild and they involve differentiation. Uh, yeah. But I guess what we're talking about is like adaptive models that are learning intuitive physics. And can we put those things out in the wild? And I, I mean, I think for, for a safety critical application like autonomous driving, the answer is like a resounding no. Uh, we're, we're not there. And I mean, I think that the state of the art in autonomous driving is like, yeah, there might be some neural networks in there, but they're put in these nice cages where they can't do a lot of harm to the things around them. Uh, and, you know, we, we don't, we, I don't, I don't know, you know, I'm not, I don't pretend to be like an expert on every single, what every single player in the autonomous driving industry is doing, but not very many of them, uh, you know, actually have, that I know of, have like learning systems that are actually controlling the actuation directly. Uh, the, the, like the thing that is very commonplace now is to have like a learning system that's doing some, some perception. And I think that part is like, you know, relatively solved. Uh, but the, the people who are doing like RL for autonomous driving or, you know, any kind of like kind of model that's a learning based paradigm that's actually 
being handed the keys to like, pardon the pun, to like uh, actually push the puddles and turn the steering wheel, like th those are extremely rare. We're still using our traditional good old fashioned engineering and models for, for those pieces. And I, I don't know when the tide will turn or if it will turn. My sense is that uh, the way that this is likely to go is that we like we want to build on a on a strong scaffolding of things that we that we know to be true and that we and and that we can write down like theoretical principles about and guarantees, and then the adaptive part is like the sprinkling that goes on out outside of that scaffolding. Uh, I think that's that's kind of the a more promising um, direction, uh, particularly for like safety critical systems. When it come when you take out the like safety critical nature, you can sort of do whatever you want, and then you can like throw any kind of crazy neural network solution at your thing and see if it works or or, or not. Um, but for safety critical stuff, like it's it's going to be I think a really really hard battle and a, a long time before we see like these kind of models actually in charge where they can affect like real people's lives. I will totally agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Putting into the wild doesn't mean that we're going to put everything into the wild, but it can be used on some application. Definitely safety critical. No, even autonomous driving, it's not approved in California yet, right? Even though we have all these autonomous driving cars. It's largely, I think I, I heard it's, it's on a fairly constrained environment. Uh, it has the potential. Okay, anyone wants to comment on it? CJ, you well, are muted. I, I think it's, uh, Liam raised a, 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 an excellent point. Uh, and I'm wondering if that then means that uh, looking at, at systems that would work with uh, the wealth of information we have from control theory, where we do have guarantees and we do have, we do, we can make bounded uh, assumptions where. Um, uh, the learned aspects are allowed to, to operate, but within a band that we know is, is safe based on analysis um, might be a profitable way for us to, to move forward on this. Yeah, there's some really nice work in this area actually by uh, Angela Scholig at the University of Toronto, who does like, is, a, is an expert on like control and, and writes down her, like her nice little tight, robust like control loop, but then thinks about how to build the learned components that are outside of that. Uh, and so now we can have like RL that's learning an inverse model, but that model is still being fed into like a, you know, a control loop that we can do things like have, uh, you know, the same guarantees so, uh, about performance and things like that. So there, I think there is like in the safe RL community, there's, there is some nice work being done in this area. Okay, great. Anyone else want to comment on this? And actually closely tied to that, let's say that we can put some of these systems in the wild. How do you initialize these systems? Much of these, you know, simulator, render, vision algorithm requires some sort of initialization. What are the way to address this issue? How do you initialize these systems? either in the wild or even in a laboratory environment or control environment or just a simulator. Uh, how, how, do, how do we initialize? Do you have these problems? I do actually believe that differential physics can have a little bit of benefit on um, initializing a experiment because um, like I, I do believe system identification would be a very nice application of differential physics then you can basically, based on your observation of uh, something like two elastic balls colliding with each other, doing, and then you do a bunch of gradient descent. It's kind of, uh, you can always infer something like the mass ratio between the two balls. And uh, we did have that in the Ching Queen paper as a in, uh, motivating example for system, uh, system identification. So that also actually allows us to actually uh, get a little bit of uh, information from the physical world to the simulating environment by somehow either looking at the, uh, at, at the physical world or use some sensors to gather some information and then fit a model. So um, that is, uh, this is actually one, of, one, uh, one area where differential physics would actually has a little bit of advantage. Great, yeah. I think Andrea was gonna say something. 
Yeah, I mean, this is a bit on the wild side, though. I, I, I put this prefix on it. Uh, but it connects to something that Georgia was saying earlier, right? Like, humans had a long time to learn how to behave in the environment. And, uh, and now you can actually even go to the, to the animal world, where the, the claim is not as wild. But there is behavior that animals have that are driven by instinct. And now you, you have to ask yourself, what is instinct? Because uh, instinct is, uh, is nature, is not nurture and therefore is pre-programmed in the brain. So, and this ties to your, what initialization do you give to the system? So it's not unconceivable that our uh, visual system and our motion control system are somewhat weakly initialized to nudge you in the right direction. I do not know to, degree, to which degree, but definitely in terms of just behavior, instinct is exactly that, right? Like um, just born animals know what to do without any supervision immediately, right? There is a uh, fawns that just uh, come out of the, the belly of their mother and just start walking. And how do you explain that if there's not some form of memory uh, passed down to generations? So, but again, this is wild, right? In the sense that we have no idea how to model this. And this will mean like some form of memory in between generations of networks that you train. And the closest thing to it will be like federated learning where you have these um, remote model that you update slowly over time, but uh, I think it's pretty interesting. But it's it's completely wild. It's like I have no idea what uh, I have no theories on, on how to do it. Well, on that thoughts, any unless anyone else is on that have comments. That I think that's a gr that's a really interesting thoughts that I think we can sit on and think about, uh, and we'll come back next year and we can debate on this, um, or we can debate over drink afterwards. Uh, okay. Um, I, I would love to follow up with you know each one of you individually. We have some really interesting discussion. Uh, I think Georgia has to leave already. Um, also, we have poster presentation coming up, so uh, I, I would like to sort of uh, you know ramping things down. I want to thank you all for an extremely interesting and stimulating and exciting discussion on all these really interesting uh, questions and. I, I wish we had more time. Uh, unfortunately, we, we already kind of running behind schedule and the poster presentations are waiting. So I want to thank you all for taking your time to uh, chat uh, on this panel format. It has been fun. And uh, I also want to thank Krishna and, and Niyam again for, for organizing the workshop. Um, so we will follow up uh, through emails or other uh, you know, informal discussion offline. Thank you all for participating in the panel and thank you all for all your interesting contribution and, and sharing your thoughts with us in this panel. Uh, there's also Joanna and Kelsey yeah. who are the, and, like and, real organizers. I didn't really do much. And then there's other organizers so who are not even here like Victoria. And... Victoria, Kelsey and Johanna, I think really shout out to them. It is they who did like a ton of the heavy lifting. I was probably just, you know, the face, but you know, they, they did all the work and it was really nice trying to put this together and it was nice to just go through all of your talks and have this panel discussion. And yeah, thanks so much for contributing and thanks for joining, taking the time. And I know it's pretty late in a few time zones from where people joined in. For instance, like Peter, uh, it's, it's probably too late for him. And yeah, thanks so much. We're soon going to start off with a poster session on Gather Town. So if any of you just wants to hang around, you know, chat, uh, anything light, uh, feel free to join us. And uh, we've got very interesting submissions to feature in the poster session. I guess Johanna will do a quick two minute walkthrough of how the Gather Town looks like. All right. Thanks so much again. Thanks everybody. Thank you.